Hello, this is Matthew Chan and Wes Weaver, and we welcome you to our latest episode of the Turnkey Investor Show. And in today's episode, we're going to talk about traditional financing and our views on it. Now, uh, before we get too far into it, this there's actually the follow-up episode is going to be non-traditional financing. So we're going to do the episodes where they're sort of separate, but they're still kind of like two parts. I mean, depending on how you look at it. So um, we're starting off with the traditional financing. And in our next episode, we're going to talk about non-traditional financing. So that's how we've got it planned. Mm -hmm. So, Wes, uh, traditional financing. The first thing that screams out at me when I think about traditional financing is credit. Yes. Is that the first thing that screams out at you? Or what? what else? Yeah. Is there something else that screams no, out at you? No, no, no. I, I guess I was just thinking it depends on which you know, lens you're looking through. But yes, yeah, your credit and you know, can is traditional financing even an option for you? Um, and there's... That's not a very nice thing to say. You've just hurt some people's feelings. Well, I can tell, I can say that because if, even if it's not an option for you, you can do what I did and you get credit partners and you take down deals together. We're not going to talk about that. That's, that's the next episode. But, but, okay. but what, when you ask me what pops into my mind, what pops into my mind actually is that with traditional financing, they have money that you don't. I mean, okay. you know. Okay. And with traditional financing, just like it's been said in books with Robert Kiyosaki or wherever, I mean, you can use the bank's money to buy assets for real estate, but you can't stocks and other things. So mm -hmm. I have used traditional financing. I, I still use it, and I control a good chunk of assets with their money. So, Well, what I want to direct is I know where you're going with this, but I want to start off because you know we have beginning uh, mm -hmm. viewers and we have advanced viewers, but we're starting out, we're going to talk about qualifying yourself. Okay. Well, the reason why Wes likes it is because he knows how to leverage traditional financing, but he doesn't have to qualify for all the loans. Right. And that's the same with me. I mean, to this day, I have like only one loan. I mean, I think mm -hmm. of the most I ever had traditionally on my credit report was probably two. Right. I mean, it, which is kind of amazing considering how many houses I have. And I don't, I mean, you, I mean, <laughs> you've had what, maybe two? Yeah, two, two or three, 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 yeah, at three, most, three, yeah, and that's at about most. it? Yeah. And despite the fact, you know, which when you compare it to the, our portfolio, right. it's it's really uh, I think it catches people off guard, and so inevitably, this is uh, we're going to talk about it. But one of the things I learned early on, and I had shared this with you, which you seem to agree with, was I don't care how good your credit is, okay, there is a limit to how many houses you can buy. Yes, but it is a starting point for most people. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay, yes. so. So there's two hats to put on. One, as you say, a lens. Okay, one lens is that you're going to qualify for the property yourself. That's mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. In the absence of that, you're, if you're not going to do it, somebody else has to do it. Right. But regardless of who does it, there are still similar things that have to be dealt with, like credit scores mm -hmm. and the qualification process. Right. What are your opinions on uh, credit scores are with the qualification process. I mean, it's very hard these days. I mean, it's 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 as tight now uh, in making this video in 2011 than it ever has been. You know, it's it's very tight right now. So, you know, it is difficult to do. You are going to have to jump through some hoops. Um, but there again, it, it it may be an avenue to get you started if you're not knowledgeable of some other creative financing sources. So the traditional financing route, you the the traditional financing route you will find will be possibly you know, the uh, easiest and you will get the less resistance if you're dealing with a real estate agent or if you don't have a house at all. Let's say you don't even have your own personal home in your name. It may be the easiest way for you to at least exercise your muscles of shopping and mm -hmm. doing a deal. Well, I'm, yeah, no, it definitely makes sense. I mean, what you're saying is, you know, you're using it as a tool to get started. Right. I mean, it's a point of entry. It is yes. not necessarily a way to make yes. it a career or build yeah. a, an entire portfolio. I guess it's a point of entry that if you are just completely green, it will be an area that you will find possibly the easiest to, at least for right now. Assuming if they have the credit. That's yes. the caveat. Yes. Now, I will venture to say, especially nowadays in 2011, uh -huh. okay, there's a boatload of people that are not able to qualify. That's true. Um, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I've never missed a payment in, in of the 20, I think like 24 years of my credit history, you know, it's like mm -hmm. flawless. But I'll tell you, my credit scores have gone down and I can't qualify for anything. At least I don't think, I wouldn't have the confidence. Because I think the underwriting guidelines are so are. stiff now. Yeah. And so, anyway, but 
moving on from that, mm -hmm. um, we do want to touch on some of the other aspects of it. Okay, so so we're talking about traditional financing. We're dealing with lenders now. Do you have any opinions with regarding uh, FHA loans and VA loans? I mean, from what I understand, FHA and VA loans are, are basically where the government backs the yeah. lender. Mm -hmm. So if so, if you default, the government will make the lender whole in their losses after they sell the property, the foreclosure, or the steps, or what what have you. So, but those programs, if you qualify for them, can make it very easy for you to get into a property. I mean, they have low down payments. Um, yeah, your requirements aren't as high. Right. You don't have to have as much down payments. And, right. Because the lender is yeah. protected, yes. it makes it a little easier for you to get in. Yes. Okay. So if All you right. qualify for one yeah. of those, and there are a few things that you have to be to qualify for them, income brackets and things like that, first time home buyer maybe, or never have bought a house. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, ask, most lenders, that, that'll be probably the first question they ask you, or that'll, when they're getting your information, they're going to know which is the <clears> easiest way <throat> for you to go. Because remember, that <coughs> loan officer, <coughs> wants to get you in a house too. So they're gonna mm -hmm. they're gonna shortcut you as fast as way possible. Well I still have an FHA loan to this day. I mean and I called my lender today about, you know, getting my mortgage uh, uh, mortgage insurance dropped and mm -hmm. so I got a few more months I get to drop that guy. But yeah, anyway. Yeah. But uh, yeah it, they still work, although it's I think it's still in flux, you know, given the whole situation. I think the government has come to the conclusion we they need to kind of back out of, you know, trying to create so many homeowners, I think right. they've gotten burned. Right. And now you don't hear too many people trying to say, oh, we need more homeowners, we need more homeowners. There's not that much talk of that anymore. Right. Right. You know? So, okay. <clears throat> now, along the sign of traditional financing, um, it, it, well, going out, I think uh, there are like credit, uh, credit lines, mm -hmm. and I think you and I love credit lines. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we like our credit lines is they allow so much flexibility. Mm -hmm. You get good, fairly decent interest rates, right? And it's just flexible. It's Very so flexible. darn flexible. There's no yeah. penalty to go grab a little bit of it or right. a lot of it, right? So, um, so what are your thoughts? Do you well, agree with me? You personal, like personal lines of credit? Well, any lines of credit. Yeah, I mean, yeah. personal lines of credit are great. I mean, uh, home equity lines of credit can be great, depending on, there again, it's always up to the user and, and how yeah. you use them. But yes, I mean, understand the difference between credit cards and credit lines, because there is a huge difference. Yeah, and so that is true. If you're not aware, you know, go research, look them up. But yes, credit lines, Matt and I have used, you know, as a great tool of being able to move money around. Uh, mm -hmm. If you get in a title, you need to go and you know, pull some money. You, you can't, I mean, you can, but we don't. You never really kind of want to pull cash from a credit card. But with a credit line, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can basically go and make a withdrawal of cash that same day and have it to do whatever you need to do with it. Mm -hmm. And it's not a cash advance fee. It's not, you know, anything like that. So credit lines, uh, is, or you, your bank may call them a revolving line of credit. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. um, now, I don't like secure credit. doesn't mean I won't, mm -hmm. okay? It doesn't mean I won't sign something, but I really like unsecured credit. I just think it just gives you maximum flexibility. Yeah. Why well, secure if it can be unsecured? Right. So, I got it. Okay. I have that tattooed right here. So. <laughs> now, uh, now, one of the things that you and I have also done in our effort to uh, expand our borrowing power and our mm -hmm. options is that we've also set up, we've pursued business credit. Mm -hmm. And in your case, you've done commercial loans on the properties. Mm -hmm. So I still consider, I mean, we're starting to get on the tangents, but you're still working with the traditional banks. Right. What are your thoughts about business credit and commercial loans? I mean, business credit is very interesting. I mean, if you create an entity, whether it's an LLC or a corporation, mm -hmm. then that LLC or that corporation is its own entity, which mm -hmm. is kind of like its own social security number. So yes. after a while, you has its own credit record. Its own credit record, yeah. right. So we have credit cards, credit lines, and you know, um, loans and things like that that are in the business name that is the, the sexy part of that is it doesn't show up on your personal credit report. Now, I do want to add uh, a caveat for people who've never pursued that, that in order for you to get that, the, the business mm -hmm. credit, not only do you have to establish you have a business, mm -hmm. okay, and report, you know, broad strokes how much revenue that, you know, that's been coming through uh, your, you know, your bank accounts or whatever, right. um, you, they do ask for a personal guarantee in yes. almost all cases. Right. So, in a sense, it is independent, but the banks aren't stupid. They know how small businesses work. So they will set up, give you this credit line or credit card, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. attached to this entity. But they also know if the entity goes away, they still need someone to come after, right. which would be us. Right. 
Right. <clears throat> so, which, uh, you know, obviously mm-hmm. you're fine with them. I mean, if you're an upholding person, if you borrow the money or you use the credit, you want to pay it back. So mm-hmm. that can be okay, but it can be a great tool of managing your personal credit. You know, if you have a lot of stuff on your personal credit and you start to build uh, some corporate credit, you know, you can move yeah. some stuff. If, mm-hmm. if you're trying to do a loan, you can move some stuff over to the corporate side, which frees up uh, your personal credit, which makes your credit score go up for maybe getting that mm-hmm. loan through additional <clears throat> financing or whatever it may be. Well, you know, the interesting thing is uh, a few years back, um, you know, as I was building up my business credit, once I had the business credit, I started transferring some of the business <clears throat> items that was on my personal side and I transferred it off. Mm-hmm. And so it's actually a multiplying factor. I mean, it increased my, you know, how I looked on my business, I mean, on the personal on the side personal dramatically. Side. Right. Because it didn't, it didn't look like that I had so much personal debt. Right. When the reality is, a lot of my personal debt was business related, you right, know. Right. So I, I think it's a wonderful thing. Now, having said all that, in 2011, I think it's a little bit harder to come by. I think it's a little bit harder to come by. It is. I mean, credit companies, they have crunched down, yeah. they've cut. Oh, they've I certainly mean, cut. They, 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 certainly I mean, cut on everybody me. across the nation. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Yeah. So, I mean, they just, they, they look at your available credit and mm. they say, okay, boom, they, they start minimizing their risk. That's what, that's what the banks and these uh, credit cards have been doing for the last three or four years. They have been minimizing their risk. Yeah. Now, a couple of my accounts, I mean, um, <clears throat> and I think this happened to you too, you know, they started raising the interest rate, they started making mm-hmm. it hard. Mm-hmm. So they increased the rates, and, and some of them you had to take them or just say, forget it, I don't want them. Right. There were others that just outright shut us down, mm-hmm. that that has happened. Right. And there's actually, surprisingly, a few um, that, in my case, they left interest rates alone. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they, they raised it a little bit, but it wasn't anything that, you know, that was very upsetting. Mm-hmm. And I was very happy. Yeah, for the most part, I mean... Uh, but, you know, it, it ran the gambit, though, is really the, what I was getting at, or what right. ended up happening. And a lot of that has kind of settled down, but you've got, you know, you can't have your whole business model dependent on your credit cards and your credit lines and things like that. So they're a great tool to have. You can use them. They can get you jump started. Uh, yeah, but you don't want to get overly dependent. Yeah, you don't yeah. want to get overly dependent That's on true. Because that you is don't, true. You don't have complete control over... Certainly not. ...what, what they do to them. So yeah. keep that in mind. Learn that the hard way. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Now, um, now, one of the things about traditional financing, now, well, I'm just gearing back to loans. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, the thing about it is I'm a person, when, whenever there's a closing, I like to read the closing, the settlement statement, the mm-hmm. HUD one, right? Mm-hmm. Now, I, you know, the thing that makes me cringe about these loans when I look at the settlement is all the fees. I mean, when you, I mean, you drill down and there's this for this guy and someone, you try to figure uh-huh. out what it is. And that stuff adds up, wouldn't you say? It does, it does <laughs> add up. And that's something to consider, like in the previous segment we talked about um, uh-huh. analyzing a deal. So when you look at a purchase price, if you're considering traditional financing, you have to consider these closing costs that are, mm-hmm. I can't even, I mean, I don't want to give you a number because it just, it varies so widely it depending does. on your it market does. and the, the price of the home exactly. you're buying it and does. things. But, Yes, there are a lot of fees involved with getting traditional financing, but then again, you have to look at, okay, am I willing to pay $5,000 to get X amount of dollars or to control this asset, or do I want to save $150,000 to go buy this rental house? So, Well, I will tell you, um, you know, the thing about it is with traditional financing, if you're going to qualify, or mm-hmm. let's say that we, you and I are going to qualify, we are paying a huge buttload of money to stick this thing on our credit report. Mm-hmm. Now, if everything works out well, that's great. But if it's a marginal deal, it kind of stinks. Right. Yeah. I mean, because it does in our market, because where our houses aren't like super expensive, like some parts of the country, right. it, 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 it's proportionally pretty high. Right. So. And that, I want to just say one okay. quick thing while he's talking about that. Mm-hmm. Remember that your personal credit, in my opinion, and I think. Keep that for like the smoking deals. I mean, <laughs> yes. You know, I mean, don't don't, don't, don't right now there and say, okay, well I qualified, and you find a mediocre deal, and you say, yeah. well, not a cash flow. Well, it's not in a drug area. Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm gonna buy it. Right. I mean, look around. I mean, you, you have some deals that are gonna be, you know, singles and doubles, maybe even triples, but save your credit and use it for just this smoking hot deal that you've got to have. It's gonna be a great launching pad if you get yeah. more houses and. Because once you ramp up however many, I don't want to throw a number out there because it's going to vary to so many people, but mm-hmm. typically, I, I think with Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, it's going to be 10. So that's even if you're great 
have a great banking relationship yeah. with somebody and everything is perfect, I think probably around a dozen, you're going to just kind of max out. But So keep that in mind and just don't run out there and buy the first house you can because you qualify. Well, you know, the way it works, and if you remember many, many years ago when you were a youngster, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I would say that, I would tell people, for, for God's sake, don't, you know, you know, the, the people start thinking about non-traditional financing after they burned up all their, That's true. and you know, right. and by that point, they've got no room to move, they can't do anything creative right. because they're just all maxed out and they, and they get stopped. And just like you said, I think, and we're going to get into it in the, in the next episode, but mm -hmm. I think people should try to do as many non-traditional financing deals as possible. Yes. Now, it, number one, is not a hit on your personal credit, right. but number two, just like you said, if there's something that's really, really good, mm -hmm. it allows your borrowing power, and it is finite, okay? It is finite. You get to choose where it goes, whether it's in a form of credit cards, credit lines, mm -hmm. or, um, you know, a, a mortgage loan. Right. You know, I, I think that our personal credits are a sort of a precious commodity it that is. we need to protect. And you need to think about it if you're thinking big mm -hmm. picture, uh, and this is, a, this is a place where I was years back. If you're thinking about, okay, well, I want to get a few houses to leave my job maybe in five years or 10 years or whatever it may be, you need to realize that building your credit or getting some available credit or maybe getting a few houses under your belt. Because once you get the loan, you know, or usually the credit lines and things like that, once you qualify for them with your jobs and things like that, you may have, I mean, that house you can keep forever, whether you quit your job or whatever. I mean, unless you obviously don't make payments that can foreclose on you, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. so keep that in mind too. So look at the big picture of, of, of what you have available, and that may be a job right now or a good source of income, uh, you know, high credit scores and things like that. And if it's a good time for you to use it, if you feel like, well, I might not be in this position five years from now, it might be a great time to build your credit or grab that first asset. Okay. Now, uh, what do you think about uh, the, the, way, the various ways of uh, making payments on loans? And, I, and for mortgages, you've, well, I guess probably nowadays you probably don't see too many interest only payments, but there was a time where there was interest only mm -hmm. and there was amortizing payments. Uh, what do you think? The lowest payment possible? Or uh, pay the sucker down as fast as possible? You know, what, 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 uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? You're smiling. It varies depending <laughs> on the house. I have some houses that are what I consider low income and they cash flow really well. They're kind of the houses we were talking about earlier. And I, those houses I put on 15 year uh, mortgages because I just didn't, there, I didn't want to draw out $35,000 for 30 years. It just didn't make sense. And because it was such a small amount. Yes. And what okay, you have to I look at, the interest, the interest rate also makes it kind of um, not so drastic. So you may have a, let's say if you have a, a 7% with a 30 year loan, well, they'll usually give you a better rate or they'll all usually That's always true. give you a better rate. for going When you with go at a shorter term. A loan. shorter term. So right. when I looked at the numbers, I was giving up maybe, I don't know, $20 a month, right. but cutting that loan in half. So. With those, you know, I made the decision to go with 15-year loans. Now, obviously, other houses were, were begging for every little bit of cash flow. <laughs> you want 30-year loans? You want 30-year loans, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I was asking for 70, and I got 30, but that was just kind of how it worked out. But no, I'm yeah. just kidding. You know, as a general rule, okay, this obviously this is an exception. I mean, you already made a great argument. Mm -hmm. um, as a general rule, especially for beginning people, I like 30-year loans. Yes. Even if you have to pay incrementally a little bit higher interest rate. Right. And the reason being is you can always accelerate the loan by yourself. Right. If you want to make that 30-year loan a 15-year loan, there is a way to mathematically calculate mm -hmm. this so you can send in an extra 100 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, do you have the discipline for it? And most people don't have the discipline. Right. But there is a compelling argument to be made if the interest rate is, you know, is substantially different. Mm -hmm. But as a general rule, I like 30-year loans mainly because it gives uh, yeah. us as investors more flexibility. See, the thing about it is, you don't think about it during during good times. Right. But you know, during hard times, especially if you got multiple properties and they're all, can you imagine they're all on fifteen year or ten right. year? Oh my God! Yeah, you're you just can't. like, oh, I wish I had that extra thirty, right. fifty bucks per property, whatever. I mean, it adds. Up. I mean, just just like Matt said, you can accept, <laughs> you can make a thirty year or fifteen. You can't make a fifteen thirty. That's so, exactly it. So that's a great. Point to keep in mind. I mean, for the general rule, you want to go 30 years, you know, get the best rate you can for 30 years. You can crunch the numbers and see if just if by some off chance they give you such a drastic rate that your payment's going to be the same uh, for the 15 year loan. But if it's not going to be the same or, or something drastic, you might want to just stick with the 30. Now, um, 
without beating the, this to death, um, I do as a, as a general rule, I do like amortizing loans. I mean, I do want a certain amount of pay pay down. Yeah. I mean, I, and I don't think we're going to go back. We're not going to see much of interest only payments anymore. Um, I think those days are over uh, as far as mortgage loans. I mean, I could be wrong, but it's, you know, I just feel like that there was too much of that going around yeah, you'll and it see got it, people in trouble. You'll see it some on no the commercial payment. side or some yeah. construction loans, some yeah. short-term three and five lo- year loans. You may see some interest only, but for the most part, banks got burned doing those construction loans and they lost their budget. Interest and, only, yeah. They want people to start paying down that right, debt. You right. know? And if that means a 30-year loan, then so be it. Yeah. So. And, uh, and the one thing is, um, now this is more timely. Um, this video is meant to be posted. Uh, this episode is meant to be seen for you know, many years to come. But I will say that as we make this uh, episode, it is um, April of 2011. And right now, there's f- full of good rates. And I think, it, but the thing about it is, I have to laugh. It's like, it's going to f- make me do anything different. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, it's pretty common knowledge that um, you know, a lot of people aren't going to qualify for these. Yeah. So, I don't know. Low rates are nice, but low rates are no good if you can't qualify. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. If, if you can't qualify, but obviously... Well, have you been tempted? Have you saw some of those low rates? It's like, you know what? I'm going to give it a shot and see if I can make a run at it. No. <laughs> so, even no. you, yeah, the Mr. Optimist, you, you still don't want to make a run at it. You're not going to go there. It's just, it, you know, it's just <laughs> I mean, when, when you may see some of the other... Uh, ways of, of building your portfolio, maybe the non-traditional route. You know, those could be a little sexier, and those those can be you know a little bit of a hotter topic. The traditional route, you know, is very limiting. And I wish maybe another episode we can get into because I used it. I had a very cool little system going. I was able to ramp up and use traditional financing to kind of put steroids into uh, the buying process, and and along with using traditional financing and. Um, other source of financing, it you know, I put them together and just sped things up and made them you know twice as fast. So there is an avenue and there is something to consider with that, but you yeah. have to understand the limitations. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is simply one tool. Yeah. And I figured right. that since we were going to talk about financing, it would make sense to talk about less traditional because that's how we compare all the other. You right. sort of appreciate the mm-hmm. non-traditional once you know uh, you you know the things the headaches you have to go through through the traditional. Yeah. So and, and you're going to have to shop lenders just like you shop real estate agents. You're mm-hmm. going to find a lot of them you don't like. A lot of them that tells you you can't do things. A lot of them that are just kind of small thinkers or, the, or, the, or their lens, their scope of practice is very small. So you're going to have to shop around uh, different lenders and find somebody that's a little flexible. Find somebody that wants your business. Yeah, that's just going to work a little bit hard. Yeah, harder for it. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us in this episode of the Turnkey Investor Show. And uh, we hope uh, our insights into traditional uh, financing will help guide you a little bit in your career. And stay tuned for the next episode. And the next episode, we're going to talk about non-traditional financing. Thank you. you. See you then.